Caleb van der Wolf asked a rather intriguing question in the comments. May I ask what your take is on Dirac's large numbers? Well, to most people involved with science, Paul Dirac is a well-known scientist mathematician. To everybody else, he's probably unknown. Dirac earned a first-class honours BSc in engineering at Bristol in England. Two years later, he got a first-class honours BA in mathematics also in Bristol. Then he went to Cambridge and did the first ever PhD on quantum mechanics. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics and he was recognised as one of the greatest experts on quantum theory. I think most of the people who watch this channel know that I don't have a very high opinion of the value of what Sabina Hossenfelder calls mathematical fiction. I think the whole of quantum theory might belong in that category. Quantum theory arose because physics had become bewitched by Einstein's relativity. Einstein's special theory began as a last-ditch attempt to save science from the embarrassment of Michelson and Morley's experiment. Michelson and Morley confirmed several other experiments which had attempted to find the speed and direction of Earth's travelling through space. Like all the other experiments, it said the speed was zero. The Earth was not moving. Einstein's special theory said it was impossible to tell if anything was moving or not. It became the saviour of all the Enlightenment physicists. Einstein's special theory later morphed into the general theory, a theory of gravity. The fundamental assumptions which had allowed the special theory to give a let-out to the Michelson and Morley experiment were abandoned for the general theory. But they were retained as totally valid by the Enlightenment for the special theory. They didn't want to admit that the disproof of the special theory removed their get-out-of-jail-free card from the Michelson and Morley result. Those two assumptions are, one, there is no medium, usually called the ether, filling space, and two, the impact speed of light against any observer, no matter how fast the observer or the light sources are moving, is always an absolute constant, C, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second. Einstein's general theory was built on a foundation of the new mathematics brought in by Cantor. The mathematicians of the Enlightenment hated the fact that mathematics was all based on God's creation. They wanted a basis from their own cleverness. It had always been accepted that mathematics was the realm of numbers. Kronika had said, God made the integers, but all else is the work of man. Cantor responded, Kronika needs God, I do not. Cantor then proceeded to create a new mathematics based on infinity and infinite sets. Infinity is not part of reality. It's a mathematical concept of a limit. The Enlightenment mathematicians were delighted. Now they could make up mathematical systems based on any mathematical concept that took their fancy. David Hilbert rejoiced and said, No one shall expel us from the paradise which Cantor created for us. Hermann Minkowski decided to create a universe with four equivalent dimensions perpendicular to each other. Length, 
breadth, height, and imaginary time multiplied by the speed of light. Einstein thought that was such a good idea, he decided to build his general relativity in Minkowski's universe. Einstein was a very clever chap. He did sterling work on the photoelectric effect, for which he got a Nobel Prize. His work on Brownian motion, the jiggling of tiny things like pollen grains in water, could have got another. Einstein was a legend in his own time, and physicists accepted his decree that the ether did not exist, and that had consequences. Observed stochastic processes, like Brownian motion on a very small scale, had been observed and had been found useful for explaining phenomena on a very small scale. This was seen as interaction with the ether. But the new quantum theory had to be built on the new reality of Minkowski's space-time with no ether. It made no difference that Einstein later admitted that his general theory was unthinkable without ether. Everybody ignored that. So not surprisingly, Paul Dirac, arriving on the scene at a strategic moment, was from the start working in Minkowski's space-time fairyland. He'd not been there when the ether had been accounting for observed stochastic processes. Observations now had to be interpreted in terms of relativity space-time and a scheme of quantum phenomena. But that was contradictory. Space-time is supposed to be continuous. Quantum theory is discontinuous. At least one of those stories seems to be wrong. I would say it's probable that both are wrong. Now, when bright people like Paul Dirac, brilliant mathematicians in the but all else is the work of man team, get involved in physics, you never know what will come out of it. Lesser mortals think about what might be happening and think up a picture of what they want to describe. But Dirac just sat with a pad of paper and a supply of pencils and dreamt up equations. He said of himself, I like to play about with equations, just looking for beautiful mathematical relations. And one day, he just plucked from thin air what would become known as the Dirac equation. Frank Wilczek said of it, Of all the equations of physics, perhaps the most magical is the Dirac equation. It was said of that equation that the properties of particles popped out of it like rabbits from a silk hat. Besides playing with equations, Dirac loved playing with numbers. He noticed that the ratios of some large dimensions to some small dimensions were huge, but similar. Like, for example, the ratio of the electrical and the gravitational forces between an electron and a proton was about 10 to the power 40. That's an enormous number, one with 40 zeros after it. Dirac was struck that the ratio of the radius of the observable universe to the radius of an electron was almost the same. I must say I'm not very impressed with that. For one thing, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 31 verse 37 that nobody will ever be able to measure the universe. For a long time, the astronomers were confident they could use redshifts and a pack of assumptions to measure the distances to the stars and the galaxies. That has fallen apart, and the redshifts have turned out not to be a measure of distance at all. But getting back to Dirac. Other ratios were concocted to come to the same value. 
For example, the square of the charge of an electron divided by a permeability factor multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of a proton multiplied by the mass of an electron comes to a similar number. I personally look at these coincidences pretty much as we've seen Sabina Hossenfelder look at such coincidences. I think these past 50 years will go down as one of the most embarrassing episodes in the history of science. I can't stop physicists from continuing this insanity, but I can distance myself from it and I can draw attention to the problem. And that's what I'm doing. The reason this worries me so much is that I think this is a systemic problem caused by the way we organize academic research. This means it can happen in other disciplines and probably does happen. This is why I don't trust scientists. I can't, because I've seen in my own field that thousands of them might pursue for decades what's obviously pseudoscience, like arguments from naturalness or the so-called wimp miracle. Hell, just the names tell you that this isn't science. It's numerology, like, you know, the diameter of the pyramids in inches is 660 times the square root of my little finger. And again, you don't have to take my word word for this. It's all in the published literature. But Dirac took them seriously. He put forward a hypothesis called the large number hypothesis, which says that this number is a fundamental constant of the universe. And Dirac was such a star in the realm of physics, he was taken very seriously. Looking at the components of these big numbers, he became convinced that they show the gravitational constant must be decreasing as age increases, and the mass of the universe must be increasing as age increases. That means matter must constantly be being created, even though a well-established conservation law says that is impossible. It also means that other constants beside G will be changing. Well, I doubt that the majority of physicists still believe Dirac's large number hypothesis. But there are research projects still going on inspired by it. But all this begs a question. How much of what we've been looking at could actually be considered to be science? A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. For the price of wisdom is above rubies. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savour. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honour. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.